Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Eric, and i um, the head pastor, or fa- thank you, one person. <laughs> oh, Graham, Graham, Graham. No, anyway. Uh, yeah, I've been on vacation and just got back. Got to bed one o'clock this morning. But I'm here. Yes. And where'd Dr. Richie go? Where, he was just in here. I was going to talk about Dr. Richie. Y'all know him as Dr. Richie. Some people know him as St. Richard uh, because he is a great guy. And he has the Bailey family here who are visiting the area with Sanctuary Friends, which is another area that you guys give to because of your generosity. They're being able to be blessed. So we're glad you guys are here. I hope you have a great week. And thankfully, we pray that hurricane's going somewhere else. All right. So I'm really excited about today's talk, maybe even a little anxious. I'm actually a little nervous because... Uh, I might step on some toes this morning, um, but that's why I don't get to speak all the time. Uh, but here's the good news. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple things, and the things that I want to talk to you about, if you're not a church person, you're going to love this today, because you know, uh, you're, you're gonna, I'm going to say some things, and you're going to think, oh, that's exactly why I don't like church. Maybe you're watching online. That's exactly why I don't like church, or I don't go to church. In fact, uh, it's, if you're here today and you're not a church person, you're going you're gonna to have fun, because you're going to get to watch a squirm because some of the reasons that you don't like church are possibly some of the things that we do. So you get to watch us as we go, oh, I can't believe we did that. You ever look back at your life and go, man, that was embarrassing. I can't believe the choices I made. We'll look back at this one day and go, look what he's wearing. Anyway, uh, so I want to actually talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about where I believe that the church, and I say not our church, but the church in general, especially the American church, the Western church, has kind of gotten off course. And I just came back from a sailing vacation. And what you do is you check your course, you set your course, and then you check it to make sure you're on course and you make some corrections. And that's what I want to talk about is possibly making some corrections. But I also want to talk about what I believe that this church is doing well. Now, 20 years ago, when we started, almost 20 years ago, it'll be 20 years in February, when we started this church, we, we knew that there were some things that, was, that, the, that, that made the church resistible, you know, and that the church should not be doing, okay? In fact, maybe one of the reasons why you've resisted church is because of the things that you thought that the church should be resisting all along, okay? And so I want to talk about a couple of those things. To set it up, though, we need to go back real quick to Jesus's final vision cast of what he calls the church, but he uses this word called ecclesia, which is a Greek word that means a movement or a gathering or a, you know, kind of a, it, it was never meant to mean a building. It was talking about a movement, okay, that he was about to unleash on the world. And Matthew, who was a disciple of Jesus, he was there for this. And so because Matthew was very literate and very organized, he took a lot of uh, notes and he recorded this, okay? And here's what he tells us has happened. Jesus has been crucified. It's been about 40 days. He, first he rose from the dead. And it's been about 40 days. And here is what Matthew says happens. All right. It says, then the 11 disciples. Why was there only 11? Because one of Judas had killed himself, right? So now we're down to 11. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And the reason why he told them to go to Galilee, which is north of Jerusalem, is because it was safer there. And these guys were being hunted because they were followers of this, what was considered a false Messiah. So these guys, these 11 were on the Pharisees' top 10 most wanted list, okay? So he says, go up to Galilee because it's going to be safer there. And, and, and the reason they're after him is because there's rumors. They believe this is a false Messiah and that somebody stole his body and now everybody believes he's risen from the dead. You follow me? Verse 17, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So... Some people don't believe still, even when they see him in physical form. And then Jesus begins what is probably uh, maybe the most important statement that he, maybe even not just the most important statement, maybe the most overlooked statement in the New Testament, possibly the whole Bible. And when I read this statement, I want you to just let it sink in what Jesus is saying here. Okay. So he's gathered them. It's, he's about to rise. He's about to ascend into heaven. This is his final speech. Here's what he says in verse 18. Some of you guys know this. Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I want you to look at this. 
Let the, enormous, the, the enormity of this statement sink in. He says, all authority. Now, where'd that authority, why did he not have it? Jesus didn't have it as a man. You know where that authority was? Satan had it. Way back in the beginning, thousands of years before this, when man sinned, he, they gave the authority, because man used to have the authority, they gave it to Satan. And Satan had it. But because of what Jesus did on the cross and because of the resurrection, he now had the authority back. And he says, all authority, not just in heaven, but here on earth, has been given to me. That is a powerful, powerful statement. Unfortunately, this statement has become kind of just another Bible verse, okay? Equated with every other verse in the Bible. And that's tragic. Because 300 years plus after Jesus said this, when the Bible was being assembled, and when I, mean being, when I say assembled, that's what it was. They took, some of the, they took the Hebrews text. Then they took the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They took some letters of Paul and some other writers, and they put them together. This is 400, almost 400 years later after Jesus. They put them together, and then someone called it the Bible. I'm not sure who did that. It just means the books, all right? So think about this. Think about this statement. 400 years before the Bible was even written, Jesus says that the ultimate authority, our ultimate authority, if you are a Christ follower, our ultimate authority is not even the Bible, but it's Jesus. In fact, the reason why we say, oh, we, we, don't, we don't believe that Jesus has the ultimate authority because the Bible says it. We believe it because Jesus said it. In fact, Jesus said that Jesus is our ultimate authority, not the Bible. All right? So think about this. Your king, your savior... If you call yourself a Christ follower, watch it online. He says, all authority has been given to him. He, Jesus, is our ultimate authority. Now, ignoring this statement and the implications of this statement, I believe is how church leaders have gotten away with such harmful uh, nonsense. And not just, I'm talking century after century after century. Because somebody like me who can stand up here because I am so well acquainted with the verses in here. I am so, I'm not trying to brag. But I am so well acquainted with the scriptures in the Old and New Testament that I can use them and misuse them. I can apply them and misapply them. That I can take something in the Bible and I could pretty much, as far as the Bible goes, justify anything that you want to hear. Anything that you want to do. Just give me a minute and I'm going to find a verse. But when you look at the life of Jesus, when you look at how Jesus lived his life and how he interacted with people, when you look at how he interacted with people, he left virtually no wiggle room. He left, there were no loopholes. There, because of the way Jesus lived, there wasn't loopholes to find a way to justify whatever you wanted to do. He closed all the loopholes. That's why he had such a running battle with, all the, with the Pharisees continuing all the time because they had so many loopholes. The teachers of the law, the Pharisees had, oh yeah, you can honor your parents, but if you want to do this and you want to save it for yourself because you it, just do it. And they had so many loopholes and you look at the life of Jesus and Jesus says, No. No, that's not. Jesus closed the loopholes. He says, listen, I'm going to get, it's simple. In fact, the night before he went to the cross, he says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, not an additional commandment, a new one to replace the others. And it's simple. The way I've loved you, that's how you love others. Love one another. As I've loved you, that's how you should love one another. So it's really simple. Okay. If it's not good for that person, then it's sin. So don't do it. If it's not good for you, then it's sin, so don't do it. It's very simple. Yeah. Now, after he claims that he has all this authority, then he uses it. And this is what he tells them that he wants this, them to do. And this is basically what he's saying. I've been given all this authority. I'm giving it to you now. He was giving it to them, and this is what he wanted them to do. And it's what he wants me to do. And what it's, it's what he wants you to do. Part of the problem is we haven't done it. And that's why we resist it. That's why we don't like to look at this statement. So of course there's resistance. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, that, right there I just need to stop for a second. Because doesn't that sound like, you know, the, the people got a hold of this and said, we're going to make disciples. So there was time in our history, not the history of this country, but the history of the world, where either you converted or you died. We're making disciples. We're taking... Confess his name or die, right? How do you make disciples? I think Jesus would say, 
the same way I made disciples. Just ask people to follow me. The same way I did it. Hey, just follow me. Lean in. Learn from me. This, this example, this, this life that I'm going to live is the example that I want you to follow, okay? I want you to live a life in such a way that people take notice and they lean in. So he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to build disciples the way I did it. Um, go, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then we read this and we, it, it, this kind of passes over us as well because just probably the way we grew up in church, okay, the way we experienced baptism. But for them, when he was talking to them, when he spoke this, they knew exactly what he was talking about because he was talking about, he was using covenant language, meaning we're in a contract. We're, in other words, look, you are being included in a covenant community and a covenant community is a community that where we all embrace the same worldview, so Jesus says, anyone who decides to follow me because you're going to make disciples, I want you to baptize them. And listen, everyone is invited. Then what comes next flows directly from this claim of authority. And if that, if that claim of authority that all authority has been given to him is the most overlooked verse in the Bible, this is probably the second one, okay? And I believe that if church leaders, and I include myself in that, pastors and teachers, could get this right, it changes almost everything. Everything that you might resist about the church, if we could get this right, it would be off the table, all right? So he says, when we go make disciples, here's what I want you to tell people. Verse 20 and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. In other words, and so I want you to gather people. I want you to gather people by living a life that causes them to follow. Invite them to follow. Let them lean into this lifestyle. And when they decide to embrace it, I want you to baptize them. In other words, hey, this is the worldview that we're taking that Jesus is who he says he is. And I want you to teach them everything I commanded. Matthew, you wrote it down, right? John, you wrote it down. I want you to teach them, okay? What I talked about, what I commanded, what I, what, how I lived and the things that I said. And I believe that if the church could capitalize only on what Jesus taught, it would be a game changer. All you have to do is focus on what Jesus taught. Forgiveness, regardless of what somebody did to you. If somebody decides to make the, you their enemy, you don't return the favor, right? Putting others first. Understanding that our wealth and our, and our possessions are tools in the eyes of God. That generosity and to show compassion to other people is more powerful. And in other words, I want, you, I want you to teach people to be the Samaritan in the story of the Good Samaritan. I want you to teach people not to be the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. He says, and if you'll do this, if you'll create followers and baptize them, teach them what I told you, here's the promise. If you do this, this is what I promise. And teaching them to obey everything I command you to you, and surely, quit calling me surely, I am with you always till the very end of the age. In other words, if you do these things, here's what Jesus says, and that means, if you'll do these things, I will be with you in a very special way. But who's you? It's not just the disciples. You are all believers who put feet to their faith. You is followers who multiply themselves. But here's the strange thing. He left, went up into heaven, and they didn't. He told them to go, and they didn't go. They actually stayed. And I understand why they stayed, right? This is where their family is. They're, this is their, they're, they're comfortable here. They love Judea. They grew up in Jerusalem. They grew up in this area. Besides that, the scriptures tell us in the book of Acts that thousands were starting to come to know the Lord. I mean, 5,000 on the first day. So there was a lot of stuff that they could do and stuff. There was a lot of work that they had. But Jesus told them to go. And they didn't go. And not long after this conversation with his disciples, this one right here, a persecution breaks out at the church because they, the church was causing so much trouble for the Jerusalem, for the Jewish religion and for the city, causing so much trouble in the temple and around that area that they began to persecute him. And look what it says in Acts chapter eight. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Look at this next statement. All except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So Jesus tells them to go and they don't go. 
In fact, what God does is he starts to persecute them to try to get them to go, and they still don't go. Everyone else goes, but they stayed. And in some instances, they might have traveled up to Galilee. Uh, uh, but this, so here's what happens. They, just, they stay, and so this movement that was started by Jesus, this ecclesia, kind of started to take on a more Jewish look, maintained a Jewish flavor, maintained a more Torah flavor because that's, they were in Jerusalem, Jewish was the culture, they were all Jewish when they grew up. And so you know what happened? This movement stalled because they didn't go. Because they couldn't imagine that it was actually this big or this wide. They thought, you know, okay, the, t- the teachings of Jesus, they kind of piled it on to what they already knew. You know, they kind of, they, Jesus became an addendum to for many of these Jewish people. So consequently, the movement, this Christianity movement, this ecclesia had a very Jewish flavor, a very Torah flavor. That's the, the Bible that the Jewish people would have used. The very, you know, Old Testament scripture flavor kind of influence like that. And that was a very big deal. In fact, you know, for them, for a Jewish person, Moses is the guy, right? He's our guy. Moses is our father, man. He's, our, he's the guy. So for a disciple to come in and go, yeah, I know we're going to get in trouble this for this, but we kind of think Jesus is right up there with Moses. You could get arrested for that. But Jesus is like, no, I didn't tie with Moses. I replaced Moses. So what happened when they didn't go Because you see, don't see this in the Apostle Paul's life. When they didn't go, this movement kind of kept this Jewish flavor, this Jewish influence to where they began to what we call mix and match covenants. They, They had a hard time not mixing and matching the covenants. And when I say covenants, what I'm talking about is the agreement, the covenant that God made with Israel, which was very important, right? That he made with Israel on Mount Sinai with Moses and the Ten Commandments. And the covenant that Jesus made with the entire human race on that last Passover before he went to the cross. Is that the trouble or the the movement stalled because they had a hard time not mixing those two things. I mean, because anyway, so here's the problem. The problem is, is that many modern Christians, and I put pastors in this, and writers, and bloggers, and authors, and speakers, have kind of done the same thing. They've mixed and matched these two different covenants, the one that was made with Israel and the one that was made with the entire human race. And I know, just you gotta follow me here. The reason why it's not hard to do is because of the way you probably received your Bible when you were a kid. How many got a Bible when they were a kid? And what were you told when when you got a Bible? You were told that this is what? God's word, and it is God's word. And it should be respected and it should be learned. And it, but what it implies though is that when you get a book that's called God's Word and you're a kid or maybe even an adult, what it implies is that everything in here is equal. Everything in here is equally applicable. And that's just not true. I mean, in kids' church, we're not teaching your, your third grader about Bathsheba and David's affair. Right? <laughs> It's not equally applicable just because it's, that, this is what happens. And see, and, 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 and you intuitively know this. How many times you read through the Old Testament and you're reading something in the Old Testament and you're like, but that sounds opposite of what Jesus said. You ever saw, we intuitively know that, all right? We intuitively know that it's not the same thing. And, and, and it's, not, it's, it's not right versus wrong. It's just, it's, it's not right versus wrong. It's then and now. Okay, and it's just different. And you know who are the biggest culprit of this is preachers. And you know what part of the problem is? Can I just talk about my industry for a second? You know, the industry that I've lived in, worked in for 30 something years, 35 years or so. Maybe I can get a little sympathy from you. I know, some people don't think I only work one day a week. I work two, okay? (laughs) And you don't know how hard it is up here. Uh, here, you know what I do every Sunday? It's like, it's like doing a book report every week on the same book. <laughs> and the author is grading you. Okay, that's how hard it is. So, because here's what happens, you know, every Sunday he's coming, okay, here comes Sunday again. All right, well, I'm going to talk, no, talk about that, check, talk about that, check, talk about that, okay. You know, what, oh, and then someone goes, hey, I know it's only June, but we need to plan Christmas. What? Um, what are we going to talk about? I don't know, the baby Jesus and some man- a manger and some wise men, right? It's no wonder we come up with a Star Wars Christmas. We're like, we're running out of ideas here, okay? So, 
But here's what happens, is we start mixing and matching these covenants. Don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing out the Old Testament. The Old Testament Paul wrote was there for, for us to learn from. But we start mixing and matching these covenants and what it does is it takes Jesus' claim as king and ultimate authority and drops it into a bucket with a whole bunch of information and we lose the plot line. That's why so many pastors talk about being biblical rather than Christ-like. You know what I'm talking about because some of you, if you've ever been hurt by the church, you were probably hurt because they were teeing off on being biblical. No, no, you can't wear that here. You're not allowed to speak. You can't come here. No, you have a past. I'm sorry, you've been divorced. And they were more about being biblical and you thought they weren't being very Christ-like. Well, let's get back to the storyline. So, the disciples didn't go. So God has to basically, he, does, he has to intervene. And he has two big interventions. One of them you know, Saul of Tarsus. He's a Pharisee. He's persecuting the church. He's part of the one leading the persecution, you know, killing Christians, arresting him. And God has to get involved. Jesus has to get involved with him, have this big intervention with him on the road to Damascus. And it was a great strategy because Paul grew up in the Gentile world. Plus he had knowledge of the scriptures. I mean, Way to go, Jesus, I think that was a good one, right? So, the, uh, so that worked out pretty good. The second intervention was Jesus had to come back and recruit Peter. Now here's the story, Acts chapter 10. This is 15 years after the resurrection, okay? And they're still in Judea. They're still around Jerusalem. In fact, Peter's at the beach. He's got an Airbnb on the Mediterranean, okay? And he's hanging out there. And God comes to him in a vision and speaks to him and says, what are you doing here? I told you. Well, that's my language. I think that's what God would have said. What are you doing here? I told you to go, right? He says, listen, he speaks to Peter and he tells Peter, listen, tomorrow there's some guys coming over to this house and they are going to invite you to go up the coast about 30 miles to the house of a man named Cornelius. Cornelius is a Roman centurion. He's very wealthy. He's got a bunch of friends and they need somebody. They've heard about the story of Jesus, but they need somebody to go up there and connect the dots. And Peter argues with them. Peter argues with the Lord. He has to do the vision like two or three times to get him to go. Because in his mind, Peter was uncomfortable with that. Peter was uncomfortable with that because he grew up in Jewish Torah-based culture. And he was still kind of adhering to that. And he knew that Jewish people did not go into Gentile homes. So even the religious traditions of when he grew up still had its claws in him. But he goes anyway. And he's thinking, <laughs> if I go into this house, I'm going to be unceremonially, I'm going to be ceremonially unclean because in his mind he was being untorical okay you know I'm breaking God's law if I step into this house finally Peter's like okay I'm gonna go and Luke records the speech that he gives these people now remember these are rich pagan non-Jewish mostly Roman citizens people living there and the first way Peter starts off is like probably how I would start off somebody very offensive okay he says to them you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile which I'm sure they were they lived in Israel right so they knew about that law but look at this one but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean can you imagine going to your first you know your first my first sentence to you is like hey I won't normally preach in a church like this but God told me that I shouldn't call you losers and lost and you know <laughs> I mean how offensive is that hey he said it's okay for me to get some Gentile cooties on me so I'm here to give you the message right and, then, and think about this. This is the most famous follower of Jesus. He looked into an empty tomb. He saw the guy die and rise from the dead. But he was still so wound up with the Torah culture, the Jewish culture that God had, you know, inspired through Moses. I mean, this was his ver version of being biblical or Torah-like, but not Christ-like. So Peter, Peter preaches this amazing message. Everyone puts their faith in Jesus. Everyone gets baptized, all right? They had heard the story of Jesus, just needed someone to connect the dots. Jesus, Peter connects the, the dots for them. They all put their trust in Jesus, get baptized. Peter gets back to Jerusalem and everyone's mad at him. They're all like, you went into a Gentile's house. You ate with Gentiles. I mean, they're, they, they, they could, and these are Jesus followers. 
but they could not get their minds separated from this Jewish culture that they grew up in, that Gentiles were off limits, you didn't sing. And Jesus like, no, I'm here for all people. They didn't know because they didn't go. So this keeps happening everywhere. In fact, we just finished the story of Galatians. We just finished that series. What a great series that was. And that's much of what Galatians is about. This is happening all over the Mediterranean. So some years later, we move into Acts chapter 15, and they have a big old meeting. They call the, they have called the apostle off the mission field. Peter's there. They have a kind of, we got to get this thing figured out meeting. And it's Acts chapter 15. All right. And in Acts chapter 15, in this meeting, um, there is a bunch of people that stand up. There's a group of Pharisees. These were the religious people that kind of, you know, they had Jesus killed. But they, after, the, look, you go say, how did a Pharisee become a Christ follower? Well, you see a guy you killed, and then you see him walking around. You know, Maybe I was wrong about that. So many of the Pharisees did put their faith and trust in Jesus, but they didn't walk away from the old covenant, the old law, okay? So they show up at this meeting, and they're, they're like, hey, no, the Gentiles have to subscribe to the Torah, to the Old Testament, to the Scripture before they can join us. Though Peter and the Apostle Paul step up and they give their stories and they're like, no, we have seen God pour out his spirit and give them to Gentiles who didn't grow, know anything about the Torah, didn't grow up in Jewish culture. And in fact, in this meeting, one of their own speakers gets up and says, hey, guys, isn't it true? Because that's all there was. It was guys. Isn't it true that us Jews, we, we can't even keep the law. We have a hard time keeping these commandments. Why would we expect to put them on a culture that did not grow up with them and have them expect them to keep all 613 commandments. So James, the half-brother of Jesus, who's the leader of Jerusalem, the church of, leader of, church of Jerusalem, he's the leader of the church of Jerusalem, he steps up and he makes a statement that we have talked about for 19 years. In fact, some of you know where I'm going. But he says this, and it's, been, it's just been, it's been foundational for us. He says, it is my judgment, therefore, after everyone's talked, it's my judgment that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. In other words, guys, I've listened to everybody talk, and what I think is my judgment, it's my judgment. We need to remove every barrier we can. Big ones, like being circumcised, and small ones, like don't eat bacon. Right? Let's get rid of those things, okay? And they did it. <clears throat> they did it. They broke cultural barriers. They broke theological barriers. They, blow, they, they knocked down traditional barriers. And it was so uncomfortable for them, but they did it anyway. And you know what happened? The church exploded. The church just blew up. In fact, there were so many Gentiles putting their faith and trust up in, the, in Jesus in the city called Antioch that these pagans in Antioch gave them a name. They branded them that we still have called Christians all because of this movement. Which finally brings me, in the last six minutes, because I had to build this up, to talk about those things that I wanted to talk about. What I, where I believe the church has kind of gotten off course, and what I think the church is doing well. But first, you need to remember this. The focus of the church, I mean the big church, should be, a, yeah, it's capital C. The focus of the church naturally gravitates towards insiders. The focus of the church naturally gravitates towards the people who make the rules, who, who, who know the songs. I mean, it's been that way throughout history. It gravitates towards those people who are in church, all the way to modern churches, the people who know the songs, the people who give the money, the people that have influence or are on committees or whatever it is. And so the focus of the church has always gravitated towards people who are, who are inside the church rather than people who are outside the church. So about 20 years ago, we, when we planted this church, we were part of a movement of churches and other churches that were out to change that. They changed that image. We were out to make churches that we weren't just the only one. There was a bunch of others. And they, we made so much progress early on. I mean, we were part of a group of churches that planted 20 years ago, 19 years ago, that were outsider focused. They were organized around reaching, not just keeping. And we began, we began to create a church that wasn't for church people. So go, guess what happened? The good news became good again. All people meant all people. Now, there was some criticism. Some of you around there. Uh, my favorite one was this when I wrote this one down. Shoreline is a great place to become a Christian. But if you want to grow, you have to go somewhere else. Pastor actually said that. 
You know, that's why we have Rooted. You saw that video of Rooted? I would encourage you. Because it, it's, not that we, it's not that we're a shallow church. We just have a strategy. And then the strategy is on a Sunday morning, we are going to lower the bar. We're going to remove as many obstacles as possible. But then we have steps like our Bible studies, like Rooted, that can cause you to grow. So if you haven't done Rooted, I encourage you to do this. But here's what happened. We were one of the first churches in this area that kind of looks this way, but other churches begin to pop up in this area. And they were reaching people, and they're still here, to where the more traditional churches begin to take notice. And they were like, hey, well, we want to reach people. So suddenly, casual was cool, right? The music began to change. Choirs weren't in so much. And you remember this? I don't see this as much anymore as he did 15, 12, 19 years ago. Traditional churches would start what they called a contemporary service. Remember that? Hey, we have a contemporary service, you know. You can wear jeans and a casual shirt. See, what, what were they doing? They were considering this a church growth strategy. Now, it's not as pre pre prevalent as it once was, but they were considering it a church growth strategy. Oh, we need to grow, so here, let's do a contemporary service. See, now there are so many churches doing church this way. I had a young man who got stationed in Albuquerque, and he says, can you recommend any church? All I gotta do is get online, because now they, 15 years later, you have what I call a modern church vibe. Like, I can get on a website and find a church that will work for you somewhere else because I can tell by their vibe on their website that they have this modern church vibe. And I'm telling you this because it's what I, what I do. But what the people who made these adjustments and changes missed the heart and the passion of this movement. See, our goal, our goal was never to, um, our goal was to never, it wasn't, it wasn't growth. And the goal of the pioneers of this movement, it wasn't growth. It was reaching people. We didn't do this to be cool, although we got accused of that too. Oh, you're trying to be cool. And I was looking at them going, well, it doesn't take much to be cooler than you. I mean, look at you, right? <laughs> no, the reason we did this, we set out to number one, remove obstacles. What are the, uh, why do you think we put the scriptures on the screen? Why do you think we put, last, mo last month we played six songs that are, were on the radio, top 10 list, right? You know, we do things to remove those obstacles. And the other thing we set out to do was to invite people to follow Jesus. And you know what happened? It happened. And it was so pure and so amazing because we didn't want to be a church for church people. There was plenty of those. But unfortunately, much of the progress that we, and I don't, take response, I don't take ownership of this, there was other churches that pioneered the way starting back in the 70s, like Saddleback, 80s, Saddleback Church and uh, Bill Hybels, okay? They pioneered this. And much of the progress that churches like us across the country were making has been undermined and kind of reversed in the last few years. A lot of it's because of the political nonsense that's been happening that's picked up speed. Because here's what's happened. Many of the people that are fueling the craziness that we're experiencing in our culture right now are conservatives. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a conservative. I am conservative politically and theologically. But much of this craziness that we're experiencing in our culture is, is, is driven and fueled by conservative, fearful fundamentalists. And some of them are pastors. And churches are actually pulling back up barriers that we spent so many years trying to knock down and even adding new ones. Let me give you one. Uh, one, of the, one of the pioneers of this movement was, was uh, Rick Warren. Anybody read Purpose Driven Life, right? Millions of copies, right? Well, uh, Rick Warren, he, before he wrote Purpose Driven Life, he wrote a book called Purpose Driven Church. And it was basically a handbook to create a church for outsiders. And it so influenced us, this was 25, 20 something years ago, that we actually pulled a term from the book. When he moved to Saddleback, they had a term for the guy that they were trying to reach. They called him Saddleback Sam. We came up with one ourselves. Anybody remember? Crab Island Charlie. That's who we were trying to reach, right? I mean, this guy was a classic modern church reformer, okay? I mean, there's no doubt about it. He was a church reformer. Now, some of you may know this. Last year, Rick Warren was kicked out of his denomination. Yeah, kicked out of his denomination. For something immoral? No. Something illegal? Nope. Something with, to do with money? Nope. Getting a boating under the influence? No, nope, nothing gla glamorous like that. All right? You know what he was kicked out of for? 
He had the audacity to ordain three women staff members in his church. I mean, they were already doing the work of the ministry. They were in there. They weren't going out to start a church or lead a church. They were already basically pastoring. And you know, pastoring is more than a spiritual. It has spiritual connotations, but it also has legal connotations. When you're ordained as a pastor, you can get that parking spot at the hospital, right? Right up front. <laughs> I mean, and you can go into prisons, jails. I mean, it gives you some, even some tax, uh, you know, tax things. So he had the audacity to, he's like, why wouldn't I do this? We're, they're doing the work of pastors. You cannot get any more insider focus than that. Now, here's what I really want to talk about. Now what I'm seeing, and it happens every four years, I'm seeing evangelical leaders, and I am an evangelical, that are prioritizing politics over mission. And what I hate is the people in their churches are eating it up. And they're piling on the message, onto the message of Jesus, all their political views. And what's happened is they elevate the message of politics over the message of Jesus. And here's how they've done it. You take some of those stories from the Old Testament and you blend it in with your politics and then you pile it onto Jesus' message. And then suddenly you're prioritizing politics over the message of Jesus. And what has happened is, here's what's happened. Political affiliation has become a litmus test for orthodoxy. And here's what I mean by that. Political affiliation, what party you belong to, determines whether I can ask you what party you belong to. And not, well, then you're not a Christian. Because you've probably seen this. It's mainstream. Right now, there's this current ideology that you cannot be a Christian and be a Democrat. Which is absolutely absurd. But what is more absurd and even more hurting is when Christians, conservative Christians, start demonizing Democrats. Because when we do that, you know what we do is we go up against one of Jesus' primary teachings. Because what did he say to do? Instead of loving our enemies, we demonize them. And what did Jesus tell us to do with our enemies? Pray for them. I actually saw a pastor online post, I will not pray for these reprobate. I'm like, oh my God. Let me say this to those of you who are politically conservative like me. If you're doing this, stop it. Okay? Just stop it. Because, listen, you, you, can, you don't have to hate someone you disagree with. You don't, because you disagree with them doesn't mean you have to label them as evil. Because here's the problem. If you label someone as evil, like Saul of Tarsus, he was labeled as evil. When you label someone as evil, evil, you no longer look at them as redeemable. And that's not how Jesus saw Saul or who became the Apostle Paul. Because what you do with evil is you get rid of evil. You throw it out. And Jesus, no, because once you do that, you no longer seem as redeemable. And it's extremely harmful language. And so my question is, are we demonizing, are you demonizing those we're called to reach? And again, I have pastors that do this online. And I want to tell them, get out of the ministry. Become a political pundit. This is too important because the message of Jesus is so important. And in fact, a couple years ago, we had a guy email us. And I know I'm going long, but this is important. We had a guy email us and says, he wants to come out and he called Crab Island Revival Island. And we're going to do revival services out there. And he wanted our help because we've we'd been out there for five years, not four. We've been out there for five years. And he wanted our help. And we were like, stay away because you will ruin everything that we've worked for. And that's how I feel sometimes when I hear these pastors. You know, because you know what happens? If you need an enemy to further your agenda, it's not the agenda of the king. Because listen, fear used as motivation is control. And if you, if you're, you need an enemy to get your agenda accomplished, that's not the, that's not the agenda of Jesus. And what I see is leaders who don't rally around what they believe in common. Instead, they're rallying around who they hate in common. Well, I don't hate, I don't hate them. I don't hate those people. I don't hate them over there. Well, no, if you think of them as less than and you write them off and you demonize them, that sounds like hate. So they rally around who they hate in common. But more importantly, they rally around what they fear in common. And you know what was the most repeated command Jesus gave? Fear not. You know what's happened? 
You know what's happened? The church has become like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember the priest and the Levite? They're coming down the road and they see a guy half dead and it says they pass by on the other side. Look what it says. And when they saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Why did they do that? You know why? Because the, the, the text forbade them to have anything to do with something that was dead or half dead, right? They, they, had, they had verses, they had scriptures, they had excuses, but they didn't have the heart of the king. And that was why Jesus told this parable because he knew that the Jews hated the Samaritans and that's why he made the Samaritan the hero of the story. Because Jesus goes, that's not how it works in my kingdom. That's not how it works in my kingdom. I did not walk by you when I saw you dead in your sins. How dare we walk by anyone and demonize them and use it as an excuse to marginalize them? Because when we do that, we alienate someone for who Christ died. And think about this. Many times over their political affiliation, which in the scope of eternity will not matter anything. No one's going to, that's not a question on the test when you get up there to St. Peter. Were you a Republican or a Democrat? It's not there. Why would we elevate that to being the most important thing to us? See, that's why you, when you go, you know. It changes how you see them. I guarantee you, when you go to Grub Club, Club, Club and you're feeding someone, you don't see them as an atheistic, pro-choice, non-binary person. You see them for whom someone, that Christ died. And I'm tired of the church rallying about being known for who they're, who they're against and what they're against rather than who we're for and what we're for. Amen. Now, I told you I was going to tell you what I like about this church. That. That's not this church. Amen. That is not you. <laughs> that's why I absolutely love this church. I love you. I love our leaders. I love our volunteers. I, because everybody gets this, Right? And see, and together we have resisted this trend, and I, but I have to bring it up because what happens, the church naturally gravitates towards insiders. And if I don't talk about it, because we'll push, we'll, we won't see ourselves doing it. It's like the frog in the, in the pot of water. So when I talk about it, it helps us push away from this. And so we, we are going to continue to operate under this banner. And that is this, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. All right, we're going to continue to operate under this banner and we're going to continue to teach them to obey everything he's commanded. That's what we're going to be about as a church. And you know what? We're going to do it because Jesus did it. And practically speaking, here's what this means. And I'm going to close with this. We can disagree culturally and politically and love unconditionally. And you know, that's what Jesus did. When Jesus showed up, nobody aligned with him on anything. They didn't align with him on how he saw the government. They didn't align with him on how he saw God, how he saw children, how he saw women, how he saw Samaritans and foreigners. They didn't align with him anything. You know what he did? He didn't care. He loved them anyway. So why wouldn't we? Why would we be afraid? Jesus said this, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Here's what I love about God's kingdom. Uh, John Henry preached this one time. He says, it's not a a zero sum game. There's not winners and losers. If we understand that Jesus has all authority and all we're to do is ask people to follow him, remove the obstacles, invite them in, baptize them and show them what Jesus said, teach them what Jesus said, everybody wins, nobody loses. You know when you go. Let's pray. Lord, teach me how to make this message shorter in the second service, first of all. But it's so passionate. God, forgive me for the times when I elevate politics over your mission. The politics of this country will be gone one day. But Jesus, your word never fails. And your church will always prevail. And your mission for your church in this world will always be here. God, help us to love people who are unlovable. Help us to love people who are different than us. And I'm praying as a pastor of this church for the next 20 years, you would continue to let us break barriers, knock down these walls. We don't want to become like the older brother. We don't want to become like the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other way 
on their way, pass by a dying world. God, we thank you so much for using us as a church and we continue to follow you and our mission forward. We love you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.